Recording has started. So good morning all. Uh, my name is Lucia Parucci. I'm the EU representative of the UMPO. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the UMPO is a, a membership-based organization created to empower the voice of the most vulnerable people in the world, in the world and uh, to protect their human rights. A few weeks ago, we have released uh, um, a report that is called uh, A Tale of the Three Ports, the Impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on the Represented Peoples in Pakistan and China, which even explores the way in which uh, the EU is complicit in Chinese human rights violations when connected to business and human rights. So um, we wanted to have uh, an idea and an opinion from uh, the stakeholders, uh, specifically from uh, uh, experts and politicians about the issue. And for this reason, uh, we have asked them to gather together to have an exchange of views. And uh, I will briefly introduce all of them. But we even wanted to make sure that everybody could have access to this conversation uh, to, um, to know what we are talking about. So the aim is to understand if uh, China is complete, if European Union is complicit uh, with China and also if we can prevent or um, uh, tackle the problem or contrast uh, this uh, complicity. So um, today we will have uh, with us uh, um, some very important speakers, and I really thank all of you for being with us. Uh, the first person is uh, the French MEP, Rafael Glucksmann, who is also the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Human Rights of the European Parliament. Hi, Rafael. Hi. Thank you for the invitation. Then we have the former UK MEP, Irina Bonvise, who used to be the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, and the, she was also member of a working group on business responsibility of the European Parliament. So thank you very much for being with us. It is great being here. Thank you, Lucia. Then we have Fabio Massimo Castaldo, who is the Vice President of the European Parliament with a portfolio on human rights. Thank you very much, dear, dear Luc uh, Lucia, and thanks to all friends from uh, UMPO and all the other organizers for this occasion. Thank you. And then we also have uh, Kai Müller, German uh, uh, Executive Director of the International Campaign for Tibet. Hello, Lucia. Thanks for having me today. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic to have you. So we are all here. We also have uh, Zuzana Ferenci, a long uh, friend of the UMPO. She used to be for 12 years a policy advisor in the European Parliament. But she also uh, has uh, a PhD in EU-China relations. And uh, since we are here, I would like to remind you that she wrote a fantastic book uh, last year entitled Europe, China and the Limits of Normative Power. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Lucia. Thanks. Good to be here. And then we have, last but not least, Marco Respinti, who is uh, the director in charge of Bitter Winter. And uh, Bitter Winter is a magazine of religious liberty and human rights. Um, and um, I would like to emphasize that in 2018, Bitter Winter was the first organization that managed to enter the education camps in China. So. I am pretty sure that today we have a lot to discuss. And uh, what I would like to do is to um, give a floor to my colleague, uh, who is the, chair, the head of policy research, Fernando Burgess, and uh, to give us some um, uh, details and the findings uh, of uh, the report uh, on the three tales so that we can build up our conversation on that. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, can you hear me well? Just always yeah. good to check. Yes, great. Yep. Thank you all for being here. I will be brief. Um, I'll just guide you through our report um, just with the highlights and actually just to give you the idea of why we put together this report. Um, so, as you all know, the Belt and Road Initiative is Xi Jinping's master plan. And since its inception, um, it has raised a lot of concern regarding security, labor rights, reciprocity of access, and impact on economic development. But 
Up, apart from that, um, the Belt and Road Initiative um, also face accusations that Beijing's ostensibly generous lending programs to developing countries are actually debt traps, um, which some say are fueling corruption and unleashing autocratic behavior in fragile democracy. So these have been the most, well, the concerns that um, you can find um, more often in articles and the media covering. What you don't find um, that often, what, it, what we feel, we, we at UNPO, we felt that there is a lack in the coverage is regarding um, minority rights. So the key point for us was to look at the rights of indigenous and minority, indigenous peoples and minorities um, whose homelands play a key role in Beijing's greater plan. So in this context, the, the, we put together this report that look at the, mainly at two cases where the rights of unrepresented peoples are being further crushed as China advances EBRI um, developments. So the first case um, uh, we look at is the expansion of the Gwadar port um, in Pakistan's province of Balochistan. And, and we also look at the Urumqi International Land Port in Xinjiang, China. So when we look at these two cases, there are no doubts, really, there are no doubts that these um, infrastructure developments are directly connected to the escalation of these ruthless campaigns against this region's native populations. So uh, in Xinjiang, we have the, the Uyghurs and other uh, Muslim minorities, and in Balochistan, the Balochi people. Um, so with that in mind, we thought of putting together this project that would look at the bigger picture and how these cases might be all connected. Um, so our report is divided actually in three parts. The first, we look at the China-Pakistan economic corridor, um, which is, which is this, um, the Gwadar port, um, which is very weird because um, the deal between China and Pakistan was, was shrouded in mystery. Um, the, it was not transparent at all, and it didn't really take uh, into consideration um, the, the local Balochi people. The issue with this project, I don't know um, if, you, if you are aware, but, but Balochistan has a, a very, very precarious human rights record in the hands of the Pakistani state. And the project is currently being implemented without addressing these pre-existing conflict in the region. So it is actually causing the increased alienation and resentment of the local population um, who are subject to gross human rights violations perpetrated by the Pakistani military. Then we move on to the second chapter um, where we look at Xinjiang uh, and more specifically at this Urumqi International Land Port. Um, it's important to understand that Xinjiang is at the very heart of what some experts call the Chinese dream, the heartland. And maybe not for a coincidence, Xinjiang has been the stage of Beijing's cruel campaign against the Muslim Uyghur population. So while construction for the land port unfolds, at the same time, the largest arbitrary detention of a single ethnic group since the Second World War is taking place. It's, it's unbelievable, as you all know. And in the third chapter, and this is quite interesting, um, a bit unexpected, we bring the focus of the debate to the heart of Europe, showing how the German city of Duisburg is proudly becoming China's gateway to the old continent. So, Although most European countries are, to some extent, tied economically to Beijing, um, we thought, we think that Germany stands out in this regard for two reasons. Firstly, because it's China's largest European trading partner. And secondly, because um, if you look at this case of Duisburg, um, it is interesting to see that there is a, 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 an appetite for becoming China's hub in Europe. Um, it, by facilitating Chinese goods, companies, and infrastructure. And moving to the conclusion of the report, we, we, uh, we provide uh, an analysis on the impact of what experts, academics, 
um, called the cynicization of international relations. Um, we look at China's manipulation of the United Nations, and we ask this question that that's the reason why we're here today, whether European countries might be um, in complicity with um, these crimes committed in, well, not only in China, but in Pakistan as well. So we conclude that rather than isolated cases, it is very possible to identify that Belt and Road um, related developments are detrimental to democratic governance in these cases that we analyze. And um, given the restricted political space and the limited media coverage of the implications of the Chinese developments in Gwadar, Urumqi, and now we're proposing to look at Duisburg, um, we're trying to build understanding of this existing pattern. And we are very, very worried that um, democratic countries, the European Union, might be complicit. Um, this is a very, very summarized um, um, reading of the report. We have some recommendations, but I think it would be more interesting to hear from you. And then I can jump in back at the end, I guess. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Fernando, and for keeping it short. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, we immediately start with uh, the hot topic, so Europe. And um, I would like to hear from uh, Kai Mueller, because we directly go talking about Germany. So, um, Kai, it would be great if you could tell us uh, what is uh, what do you think is the relationship between uh, Germany and China, and most of all, which are the juicy insights to understand this relationship? Well, there's, uh, uh, thank you, Lucia. I think it's a it's really a crucial relationship um, in, in Europe, Germany, and which China and Germany have. Um, I mean, looking at from the from Berlin and German perspective, at this, as a uh, representative of a civil society organization, I would I would say it's a mixed picture. It's uh, it's uh, a very ambivalent situation. Um, over whereas over the past years, um, skepticism um, about um, uh, trade relations um, have grown here in Europe without a doubt. Uh, here in Germany, in particular, and uh, it is. Uh, Increasingly, increasingly being understood that the trade relationship with China is not just about exporting goods, but it also affects our values and ideas. Um, um, more and more people, um, I think, understand that um, that there is a grant uh, grant model, a grant plan um, behind the, the Chinese uh, relationships uh, with the West and the rest of the world. And I mean, it's clearly laid out in those numerous speeches and uh, papers uh, given by Xi Jinping since 2012, 2013, which indicate that, that uh, China and the Communist Party endeavors to, uh, for a rejuvenation of the Chinese uh, people of China, and it wants to become a leading world um, power and lead the world into uh, a new era. And it is uh, a competitive relationship. Um, if you look at the language here, here it's spoken of the ultimate victory of socialism over capitalism, broaden our comprehensive national power, I cite from 2013, to improve the lives of our people, build a socialism that is superior to capitalism, lay the foundation for the future where we will win the initiative and have the dominant uh, position. So this, these are statements from 2013. And the Achilles heel from my perspective, and this is, uh, something that has a direct uh, um, effect on how human rights are being discussed here, how, for example, Tibetan and Uyghur rights are being discussed, is the um, the ambition of the Chinese government um, to not just um, not just shut down criticism, but also to undermine Western values because it views such values as a, a threat, uh, as a threat to uh, its own governance, its own power. If you look back at 2013 already, uh, some of you may know this uh, infamous directive um, number nine, which clearly lines out, and I cite again, um, that the party would be in an intense ideological struggle for survival. Um, ideas that threaten China 
with major disorder include separation of powers, independent judiciaries, universal human rights, Western freedom, civil society, economic liberalism, total privatization, freedom of the press, and free flow of information on the internet. So in one word, what is being viewed as a threat are those universal values that make a open and liberal uh, society, which is also the basis of our international order um, uh, from my perspective. With Belt and Road, from our perspective, there's a dependency created. And um, um, if you look at, for example, uh, some uh, anecdotal in incidents, take for example, um, Daimler, Mercedes posting a Dalai Lama quote on its Instagram account in 2018, which caused, uh, prompted the, the company's leadership to apologize to, to Beijing, to the ambassador, which basically, I mean, was uh, viewed by a lot of people here in Germany as a shameful act uh, of, of uh, kowtowing to an authoritarian regime. And um, civil society human, uh, and the human rights movement feels this heat first because we see how much uh, how much um, the Chinese government is investing into uh, into shaping the narrative here in Germany around its ideas and this um, this leads a lot of stakeholders here in Germany unfortunately still to today to downplay human rights issues to somewhat view um, victims uh, of human rights violations in uh, China, Tibet, and Xinjiang as somewhat collateral damage. Uh, narratives of, of perspective, uh, of mentality are being used, uh, basically saying it is uh, the Chinese are different, so we cannot apply uh, our points of view uh, and our assessment to them. And um, this is um, against this background um, to um, to engage with the Belt and Road without this understanding, um, particular in Germany, um, it is not just just undermining it's self-defeating in a way. Um, if um, if it is not being understood what the general concept of this is, and you mentioned Duisburg uh, as a port city, which um, is is very vulnerable to this thinking uh, from what I can see because it's a structurally disadvantaged area which is longing for investment. And here we have it from China. There are run about uh, 120 trains per month that arrive from China, freight trains, uh, I, I read. And um, there's a strong lobby um, to, uh, to support uh, a discussion on the Belt and Road here, here in Germany, uh, which is not, not, I think, dominating the discourse, but they are, they are, uh, they are I think uh, rightly so concerns about uh, growing um, the growing growth of these narratives uh, here in, in Germany, which favor a economy and trade discussion only um, um, on the expense of a human rights discourse. Whereas I should say uh, by closing, there is growing skepticism also among the business community, but particularly among the smaller and medium-sized businesses. Uh, here in Germany with regard to uh, Chinese uh, engagement and Chinese trade rela uh, trade relations with China. So uh, from our uh, point of view, there needs to be a great deal of caution when dealing with uh, uh, Belt and Road. And we would favor if uh, European countries would uh, think twice before engaging with it. Okay. I think that is actually great and gives like a very uh, comprehensive idea and now things are going on. So let's say that there is a real need to at least prevent like uh, that things are going even in a worse way in the case of complicity uh, of Europe uh, toward this issue. And um, I want to um, quickly move to uh, Marco, uh, if you agree, Marco, because uh, yes. you are the person that has been following a lot this case and um, you are Italian. So what is uh, your idea of uh, the things are doing, uh, like even Italy, uh, considering the, the virus? And uh, what do you think we should really know in this context? 
first of all, thank you, Lucia, for having me here. And hello, everyone. I didn't have a chance to do this earlier. Uh, yeah, the premise of my consideration. Well, um, um, as you as you mentioned, I, I work with bitter winter. We don't enter politics. We don't discuss economics per se. Uh, we 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 focus uh, on human rights uh, rights, and uh, chiefly among them the fundamental human right of religious freedom. Um, the premise is that the. Uh, the for the Chinese regime, the recent coronavirus crisis has undoubtedly been a great occasion for massive propaganda. Um, Chinese regime is surely guilty for silencing, uh, silencing early alerts on the virus, delaying intervention, and objectively helping infection uh, with the probable complicity of the World Health Organization in an astonishing cover-up. Um, so, from from uh, from our point of view, really focusing just on on the on the problem of human rights, we we see that uh, oftentimes people have been literally bribed into thinking that China was a help in the world, while it was the opposite. And this is especially true Italy, which is one of the countries that you know who suffered most and first because of the virus. I live in Lombardy, Lucia, as you know, uh, the northern uh, Italian region, which has paid and is still paying the high death toll to the pandemics. Well, we, we assisted here to a, uh, to a real kind of neo-colonialist attempt of Beijing um, to, to, to try to conquer the mindset of the people into crediting the regime for, for all that is good. In the meantime, China was keeping on lying. And this is, of course, going to the topic of today. And this is, of course, part of the strategy uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. You, you, again, without entering, from my point of view, at least under the hat of bitter winter, without entering the, the specific topic of politics and, and economics, uh, what we see is that you know, China is, is trying to, to sell itself to the Italian people as the good guy, so that he, uh, we, we, from, from that, China can implement its its um, new Silk Road um, uh, initiative in a much uh, smoother way. Uh, the coronavirus proved to be an unexpected but welcome weapon for China to to to, to this strategy using health care and foreign aid. Uh, um, Italian people chanting, thank you, China, from the balconies during the lockdown, completely forgetting that tyrants have never to be thanked for anything, shows it pretty well. As well as the difficulty we encounter, we at Bitter Winter encounter every day now in lifting the veil of silence on violation and persecution that continue in China. We have also been repeatedly attacked in new forms in daring criticizing benevolent China. But let me remind you uh, that just two weeks ago, DAFO, the world famous organization for medical doctors fighting against the horrible plague of human harvesting on prisoners of conscience in China, released a, a devastating report on how Beijing tries to reshape what is left of globalization through a silk road of health, using propaganda and continuing repressing people. Uh, Italy has been and is a starting point of this uh, attempt. We were just touching on Tibet. Let me also remind that exactly 25 years ago, China kidnapped the 11th Panchen Lama, which is, who is the second highest authority in the Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism after the Dalai Lama himself in order to control Tibetan people. And China, an atheistic regime, is also deciding which lamas have the permission from the state to reincarnate. Can you believe this? And that's what they're doing. Several European parliamentarians just wrote to China's president, Xi Jinping, asking for the immediate release of the 11th pension lama and its family. But once more, they obtained only silence. In mid-March, the U.S. State Department issued its new Animal Human Rights Report denouncing a staggering situation of violation and persecution. 
Just a few weeks before, in early March, a bipartisan resolution of the U.S. Senate has asked to move the forthcoming 2022 Olympic Games to be held in China to another country, since China, quote, commit crimes against humanity, quote, end quote. Uh, we all know, in, uh, working at Bitter Winter, and you underline uh, how we were affected, not to thanks to uh, Western guys like me, but thanks to the people we have on the, on the ground in China working at the risk of their own lives to, to, to denounce this situation. We know that all religions are persecuted, Muslim, especially Yugos and other Turkic minorities, not only but chiefly in Xinjiang, Taoists, Buddhists, Protestant Christians, Catholic dissenters, all kinds of new religious movements, from Falun Gong to the Church of the Almighty God to the Shouter to Jehovah Witnesses and others, Jews, even traditional folk religion and state-controlled churches. Well, we need we yeah. Uh, we had to keep we, it a bit short because we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is just the, my last line. sentence. My last sentence is, you know, we, we hear nothing of this in uh, the European Union and from, uh, from many um, of its member states. Uh, I, we think, I think that um, Europe should openly face all of this and decide on which side uh, they want to be. And uh, I would like to add that uh, Europe should uh, push even more to make sure that your colleagues will, are going to be released very soon. Um, because this is uh, like very dangerous and very worrying. Um, and thank you very much, Marco, for giving this uh, this contribution. Um, I will jump uh, actually immediately to uh, hear from the uh, actual, the, the real now uh, vice chair uh, of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, Mr. Glucksmann, because I know you have been working a lot on the issue and. Uh, you are incredibly vocal, and especially regarding the Uyghurs. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, I think I have even yeah, muted you. You, you are now able to, to, to talk. Um, Rafael, are you with us? Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah, great. So sure. this is like a very important day. Uh, today is the first day of the uh, National uh, People's Assembly in, uh, in China. and. Uh, in the future, we are going to have, uh, even in the European Parliament, release uh, of amendments of the common commercial policy. So uh, tell us, what do you think about all this situation? I think until now, uh, we were uh, way too silent and uh, too naive also. I don't exclude that uh, some, uh, some part of this naivety is based on the uh, interest and sometimes even corruption but mainly i think the roots of our naivety is, is uh, to be found in this uh, fabula of the 80s and the 90s uh, on the happy globalization this fabula was telling us basically and actually it was dominating the european institutions that the more you trade uh, the more you democratize and the more you promote human rights because there will be, according to this myth, a uh, direct connection between uh, trade and, and uh, democratization. And what we are witnessing now is that uh, basically this was totally false. And uh, what China is showing is that uh, trade is, uh, can be a tool uh, in order to implement political agenda. And uh, we need now in Europe to come back to, to politics and to policies. So that's the first thing. The second thing, before entering into what we can do, actually, uh, the second thing is we don't define China in the European institution. We don't know if it's a strategic partner or if it's a systemic rival. Both terms are used. And uh, right now there is a lack of thinking of uh, what is actually the China re Chinese regime for, for European interest and European values. And uh, this is also connected to this uh, myth that we don't have enemies anymore, that uh, the world is global and we only have partners. And this is a very powerful myth inside the European institutions. So once we abandon this myth and we try to have a realistic approach of what kind of uh, um, uh, danger and threat uh, Chinese expansion can uh, be, then we will be able to discuss about political tools that we can use. And uh, 
the first thing we have to understand is that it's not just a competition of interest about trade. It's a competition of systems, of political values, of, uh, of rules, of principles, of visions of the world. And as soon as we can agree on that, then we can move to what we can actually do. And we can do really many things if we decide that we want to use the tools we can shape. Uh, the first thing, we have to reassert our sovereignty and uh, our European sovereignty. And let me remind you that just before uh, the corona crisis, we were discussing about 5G and, uh, and Huawei. And you had a lot of people inside the European institutions uh, in very high level position explaining to us that, uh, yeah, but if it's the best offer and uh, the best way to get 5G in a quick way and uh, least expensive uh, manner, then no problem of sovereignty. We can give that to Huawei, which means to the Chinese regime itself. And, and this thinking has to stop. We have to understand that uh, we need our sovereignty and that's very much uh, the moment to do so because I think most of uh, uh, European public opinions were shocked on discovering how dependent we were for masks, for, for, for basic medications uh, on China. And, um, and so the first thing is the sovereignty, because if you want to be able to act, then you have to assert your independence and your autonomy. The, then you have a, a series of tools that we have to promote, and the European Parliament can be efficient for that. First thing, of course, it's the Magnitsky Act. I mean, you, you can call it Magnitsky Act, you can call it uh, the way you want, I'm not attached to one specific name, but a mechanism of sanctions, tar targeted sanctions for human rights violation. And this is very important because it's a way to show that uh, we can actually hold responsible uh, individual people who are in the crackdown uh, machine. You know, and when it comes, for instance, for the um, biggest mass deportation since World War II, as we speak about Uyghur people being deported by China in, in so-called re-education camps, then it will be very efficient to target uh, individually those who are responsible for this deportation and these mass crimes. The second uh, thing it, it, I think that will be very useful is uh, what we are working on now in the Rights Committee, but also in, with the Jury Committee and, and, and INTA, Committee, it's the idea of uh, due diligence uh, legislation in, in, in Europe, a European due diligence legislation to make the multinational companies accountable for uh, the violations of human rights, social rights, environmental rights that they are part of, accomplice of, uh, with their filials in, uh, in, in, in China, for instance. Not only in China, but it will be obvious in China. And you also the uh, ASPI report uh, about uh, forced uh, labor from Uyghurs that were deported and used uh, uh, for the interest of Adidas, Nike, uh, let me quote, all the brands, including the one owning my iPhone right now. So uh, this, this due diligence legislation is, is, is really important for us. And then when we speak especially about, about your report, and um, actually right now I'm working on the, on the revision and evaluation in the Trade Committee on the GSP Plus uh, system of uh, European trade, and especially on the case of Pakistan. And there is a, you know, we, <laughs> In a way, we are a bit Soviet in Europe, so we created uh, lots of, uh, of very uh, progressive tools on paper. And, and, and for instance, GSP for that is quite interesting as a tool. But then we don't use them because we don't care about papers. So actually, uh, for when you compare to US, for instance, when they have a much less progressive legislation on trade, the only difference is that sometimes, sometimes they are using this legislation that they passed. And, and we are not using our tools. And, and, and basically, uh, these tools, if they are used, can be useful when we speak about Baluch people, for instance. And, uh, and, and we have ways to put pressure on Pakistan, uh, really. I mean, we should not consider that China is the only power that has uh, actually some, some, some uh, influence over, over governments and countries. And more generally, 
there is an emergency to revise our trade policy in, in general. And, and to understand that, of course, we don't want to close our borders to trade, but uh, that we need to think politically on trade. Uh, trade is not the basis of, of our vision of the world. Trade is a tool if we want to uh, develop, to help other countries to develop, and to promote uh, our uh, rules and our uh, visions of the world, which, is, <laughs> which are based on, on human rights, uh, respect for environment, and uh, on the social rights. And for that, uh, actually, we need to, to, to have a new approach. And, and to understand, I mean, if you think that uh, we are now discussing about uh, investment mechanism with China and that we have coming uh, EU-China summit, I mean, this is a bit most test for, for European institutions and we have to work together to organize campaign and to, I think, use this leverage that we have now that uh, people are on alert on these issues, not especially on Uyghur people, on Baruch people. Of course, that's not the main priority of uh, European public opinion as we speak, but trade issues and uh, the way we are losing our sovereignty are uh, at the center of attention. And we need to, to focus on that and to use that in order to promote uh, um, a human rights agenda that will be strong and not perceived only as moralistic, but that as realistic. And that's, that's what I want to say is that I come from a, the activist background on, on human rights issues. But what I want people to understand is that what we are doing here, what you are doing with your report, it's not moralism. It's not a, a problem of uh, just human rights. It's a, it's the most realistic approach of what the Chinese regime today represents the world. With. Those who are telling you that actually business is business and we should go on like that as if nothing happened, as if Uyghur are not deported, as if Baluch people are not eradicated, as if there was no human rights violation, as if we don't care about sovereignty in Duisburg or, or in Geneva or anywhere else. These people are not realistic. They are just corrupt. They are just attached to their own private interests, but they are not attached to the general interests of the European citizens, which is to build a Europe that's actually sovereign and that can, of course, deal with China, but not as vassal. Deal with China as a strong, independent power that can implement its own agenda, even when it's confronting the Chinese regime. So. I think right now we have a turning point, and that's why I think your report is very important, and it's part of, a, I hope, a more general campaign. We should work all together, and finally, finally, shape a, a, a policy that will be stronger on human rights, but most of all stronger on just the general interest of, of European citizens. Raphael, thank you very much, and I couldn't manage to stop you because you gave us so many suggestions and so many um, practice, practice, practical way in which we can tackle the problem. And I can, uh, I can simply say that we are going to following that very closely, uh, especially with regards to the due diligence and the GSP. Uh, we have also released a, a report specifically on the uh, human rights violations in Pakistan with uh, relation to the GSP+. Plus. So um, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. And uh, I'm very glad to hear that not only the Subcommittee on Human Rights uh, and the Trade are working on that, but even the URI Committee, which means it's like, in this case, it's really responsibility of Europe. So thank you very much. And you know that we are going to knock your door very often, as uh, we usually do. Um, it's open. It's open. But, so we are super happy to, to join you every time and your team. And um, again, we are very sorry that we have missed in the parliament Irina. Um, then this is a, a huge loss. Uh, but uh, I want just to 
uh, inform all of you that uh, all the MEPs here have been um, supporting the nomination of Ilan Totti to the Sakharov Prize in 2019, and uh, Irina uh, was uh, in uh, the um, in the um, in the committee, in the, in the political group, actually, that uh, was uh, nominating Ilan Totti as uh, the group. So um, I thank you all of you. And um, Irina, you are now in the UK, uh, but uh, what do you think is uh, the relationship between the UK and China, since Europe means also Brexit, so we have to tackle the problem even from the point of view of uh, the, the UK alone? And um, since you have been part of this uh, working group, which I think is incredibly important, what are your insights and your suggestions about that? Thank you, Lucia. And um, first of all, I want you to extend a very big thank you to Fernando and the UNPO for this excellent report, which I think was not only timely, but also really important um, in raising awareness. I think most of us, and certainly during my time at the Human Rights Subcommittee, we've heard quite a lot about the horrendous fate of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, um, and of course, uh, the, the democracy protests in Hong Kong. The fate of the Baloo people in Pakistan, I think, is much less known. And, um, and also the really important link and the complicity of some of the European member states, and notably uh, Germany in this report, I think, raised a really, really um, uh, crucial issue in, in this global pattern. So maybe a quick word about the role of the UK. And I think there, there are three things here to, to remember. The first one, of course, is the special position that the UK has through its colonial history and, of course, the Commonwealth Network, which is still in place. Um, there is, I believe, there is a special responsibility for the situation and, and the, the development in many parts of the world, including some directly influenced by China. And I don't just mean Hong Kong. Um, but also countries affected by the, the Belt and Road Initiative, such as Pakistan. And I think the UK should recognize this responsibility and, and also maybe the role that it played in, in weakening or eliminating chances of self-determination for many unrepresented peoples, such as the long suffering peoples of, of Kashmir, which is now, of course, divided between Pakistan, India and, and China. So that is one thing. Um, the second thing is that the very, very regrettable withdrawal of the UK from the European Union, I believe, has significantly weakened the UK's voice and geopolitical standing in the world. In the past, British NGOs and diaspora groups um, from unrepresented peoples and others in the UK, which there are very many, um, had a very powerful platform to speak from at the European Parliament. So during my uh, seven months as, as vice chair of the Human Rights Subcommittee, I regularly spoke up for constituents in my constituency in London um, with links to the yoga community, uh, Hong Kong human rights defenders, and, and many others. Without EU membership, of course, we've lost this platform and the credibility and, and authority that I believe is, is attached, is still attached to what is the biggest democratic bloc of nations in the world. And then, of course, severing the trade relations with the EU will expose the UK, I believe, to far greater economic and political pressure from other global players, such as the US and, and China. And with, with Donald Trump further retreating into protectionism, it doesn't look like bilateral trade talks with the US are particularly promising. So China is looking at this and is already weighing um, their options. And whilst the, the Belt and Road Initiative has not quite reached the UK yet, we shouldn't forget that China is already heavily invested in British physical and digital infrastructure. For example, through huge investment in real estate in the city of London and Manchester, in Manchester and Heathrow airports, Thames Water, which supplies uh, water to uh, my uh, city of London, for example, 
um, and the new nuclear power plant, Enkley Point C, which is owned by a senior French joint venture and is usually important for energy supply in the UK and possibly beyond. So after the Brexit transition period at the end of this year, which, which now seriously at risk of ending in a no-deal Brexit, the UK economy, which is likely to be already on its knees after one of the worst corona outbreaks in the world, will be even more susceptible to this aggressive uh, Chinese uh, strategy um, and thus will be losing even more political ground. So I am I'm particularly worried about this shift and about the, the, the isolation that the UK will now see within the European bloc of nations. And um, I believe that, for example, the, the Huawei discussion um, in, in the UK is going to be influenced by that. And then on, on the recommendations, um, I very much agree um, with Rafael on um, the role of businesses. I think, yes, we do need mandatory due diligence in supply chains. Um, and of course, a lot of British companies or British owned companies are heavily involved in um, many countries with, with very dubious human rights records. That is retailers, insurers, um, global shipping companies and others. Um, and finally, the UK has in, um, legislated uh, for something that is similar to the Global Magnitsky Act in that it does have the tools theoretically to impose individual sanctions on human rights violations uh, or perpetrators as well as freezing assets of such perpetrators in the UK, of which we know there are many, particularly in London. Um, but unfortunately, in practice, it doesn't. It, it hasn't really used this tool to date. I, I don't know of a single case of a Chinese uh, a perpetrator, for example, with links to um, to London or uh, the UK, where the the UK um, Magnitsky Act or equivalent of the Magnitsky Act has actually been used. So the tools are there, but they're not being used. And I think again. This is a political decision, decision and uh, the, the willpower um, to use this act will, will greatly depend on, on our independence from Chinese pressure. So I'm, I'm afraid it's not a very optimistic view. Um, maybe another reason to fight for a close alignment, continuing close alignment to the EU, even when sadly we are, we are not a member anymore. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, indeed, it's not uh, a very positive uh, overview um, of what is happening, but it's a real one and uh, the reason why we are here talking. So uh, we really have uh, to tackle the problem. Um, I know that um, Fabio Massimo has to leave, so um, I want to introduce him by saying that uh, he has been part of a a friendship group on the Uyghurs for a long and is still part of that, actually is the president. So um, I really would like to thank him for uh, being so supportive over the years. Uh, and um, it was not easy at all, but he has always been uh, uh, supportive of human rights uh, and uh, the most vulnerable world people in, uh, in the world. So um, uh, Fabio Massimo, you have a very particular role um, what do you think it's uh, your takeaways out of this conversation? Thank you very much, dear Lucia, for this very important meeting today, for this uh, uh, interesting exchange of views with uh, the stakeholders. And I would like to thank once more Fernando and Kai for their very important contribution at the beginning of, of this uh, dialogue today, of this exchange, as well as my colleagues, uh, Rafael and Irina, uh, because of course, as uh, Rafael will say before, we should not be naive and we should understand exactly what is the wideness and the dimension of the challenge that is in, for, in front of us in terms just not a, about of economics and commerce as sometimes, uh, unfortunately, 
we are um, not we uh, personally but the public opinion in our countries are, are a bit pushed to focus on but in terms also of politics of coherence with our values of a dimension of the european union in general as main uh, global political actor and able to defend and promote a model of freedom democracy uh, worldwide with a soft power approach that should continue to characterize our action and our vision. And uh, of course, this in somehow uh, we should try to understand that uh, uh, this is extremely linked to the way in which we are going to act in the third countries in which we are going to interact with uh, in, in a world in which uh, because of globalization as was said before there is a bit uh, the illusion that uh, all of the other counterparts are um, by default uh, single um, just par partners and not also sometimes competitors and not also sometimes uh, promoting the different system of values that are in full, um, some, often also in, in, a, in a full contradiction with the, this kind of values and the principles we are trying to promote. Well, I'm saying that because, of course, I heard with a lot of interest what Rafael and Irina has said in the last intervention, and I truly believe that we need to implement and more instruments to monitor and to discuss uh, the issue of the due diligence and the business responsibilities inside not just our commercial policies but inside our foreign policies mm, at, the, at the European level. And I also see still nowadays uh, kind of, a kind of structural deficiencies in the links between uh, the EEAS and the Commission and the, their dialogue with the European Parliament uh, with regard uh, to this specific topic, topic. I also remark a kind of lack of active and uh, continuous interaction uh, between the institution that is making sometimes difficult to collaborate to concrete actions for the protection and the promotion of the human rights, but also is making our image uh, a bit contradictory uh, with the Parliament often extremely ambitious and coherent with the defence, but the Commission uh, and the EAS uh, more focused on the defence of the business as usual and uh, less uh, uh, brave in following our recommendation. This is a kind of control and the impulse of, uh, of our mechanism of trust towards the executive body that should be absolutely uh, uh, strengthened in our dialogue with uh, the EAS and the Commission. But at the same time, I also would like to underline another aspect that is extremely important to be credible, that this full compliance should also be pushed uh, in, uh, about the actions and on the actions of the European business companies in the developing countries, especially in Africa, because one of the most important uh, narrative, or, or I would say even counter narrative, that is uh, pushed by the China authorities in their interaction and their uh, growing relationship, uh, especially with African countries, but I could, uh, of course, uh, increase this uh, reasonment and share this reasonment also for other parts of the world is that uh, somehow they are those ones who are really investing, creating facilities, creating industries and pushing for the growth of the continent while the U Europe so far has just exploited the continent and they would like to continue with uh, this model and somehow so um, I could also uh, remarks in my interaction with uh, uh, some of the le African leaders uh, that this is a narrative that uh, is uh, followed in the, in the I think that's why we should absolutely push in this regard to understand that our model should not be just uh, explained theoretically but should, should, should see a full compliance of our action if we want to be credible and if we want to show that uh, the privilege partnership and, in, 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 and friendship uh, with the European Union as also is bringing also a, a concrete action and perspective to strengthening uh, the possibility of growth of the continent, but upon all of growth of the standards and the quality of the life of the population involved, especially the most fragile ones, because we know very well that on the other hand, uh, the, the other partner is not really con concerned and stick to the uh, uh, defense 
of, of, of any conditionalities in the respect of the human rights. This is fo his focus on just on commercial and economical issues. And that's why I think that we should also strengthen our action uh, towards the interaction with the local leaders, with, uh, um, with other um, level that are not just the governmental one, but to be more more spread in the on the territories and with our project and with our, with all our um, involvement of, of the local stakeholders um, of course i should uh, i would like to say that uh, this um, idea of using uh, a reflection on gsp plus uh, could be uh, part of the consideration the solution but i would like also to stress on the fact that we should be extremely, extremely careful in this regard, because uh, taking, for example, the case of Pakistan, in which there's been reported serious violation of the respect of the human rights of the Baloch community, especially uh, as was saying very well by the, your report in the, in the port of, uh, of Gwadar with the massive uh, uh, protest and the implementation of projects that uh, has been uh, partially disregarding, of course, the necessary involvement, consensus, and full respect of the human rights of the uh, local communities involved. I also think that uh, uh, we should be careful because I, I have um, exactly this fear that because of uh, what has been said of the some countries stuck a bit in the, in the debt trap towards China, if we'll cut, just simply cut off this um, special relationship and this instrument and withdrawing that uh, with Pakistan, somehow we will m m uh, turn them even more dependent by the Chinese economical investment and presence. And uh, we will probably aggravate the phenomenon instead of trying to reorientate the action to uh, full respect and, and involvement uh, of the uh, local communities and the, the most vulnerable parts of the society. So I think that the, this should be played on the contrary, on a constructive and st strong dialogue with the Pakistani authorities in which we will try not to just uh, use the nuclear weapons and how, but to let understand that we can uh, we really apply a concept of more for more, as many times we said, and less for less, but not passing to a system in which uh, maybe we have been too much silent from another one uh, with an extreme solution that probably, as I said, could be counterproductive and put again even more these authorities in the um, in the commitment and it would be to put them obliged to just to rely on the partnership of China that will become more and more uh, in, in for them probably the only viable solution and uh, will let, fem, let uh, uh, fell down them inside the, this trap of the debt. Um, again, I would like to stress uh, on uh, what has been said uh, um, <clears throat> by Irina, that uh, the creation of the working group of the responsible business conduct that uh, she was part before Brexit, and I, I really hope that she will continue to give uh, them an important contribution even now, has been extremely useful also to uh, have an, a good exchange of ideas and a better information among the MEPs, but we have to try to institutionalize that and even to be, uh, to turn it into some more ambition instrument, eventually even thinking about a subcommittee uh, specifically focused, or special committee specific, specifically focused on that, because this is the ground in which we are playing the new challenge of the uh, next years, especially in the, uh, defending and uh, promoting a model compliant with our values and uh, with the commitments we took at the, at the international uh, uh, level, and also to trying to implement a working tool for a constant monitorship of the implementation of the measures and the decision we are taking, because I have often the sensation that a uh, matter of uh, commitment that we are taking, we are, let's say, much more compliant than uh, with our effective implementation of, of those commitments. And um, I also think that uh, trying to uh, uh, think and project and implement a system of uh, uh, almost automatic san sanctions targeted to the responsible, to the concrete and individual responsible of human rights violations in third countries could be extremely helpful. I know that there are resistances from uh, many member states' government, 
but this is also a tool that must be explored. It's, uh, as was said before, it's not a matter too much the name of the tool. It's not it's so important the name of this tool. It's not so important uh, the label we are trying to put, but we should try to uh, set some um, uh, criteria that would be applied disregarding who is the uh, third partner involved because the sensation also is that often we are seeing uh, as a, uh, as an actor of uh, double standards that is extremely uh, strong with the weak and sometimes extremely weak with with, uh, with the strong uh, this uh, this kind of contradiction of course is undermining our credibility at the um, at the global level um, i think so also um, Again, that this is a matter of linked to what uh, also some economical and commercial actors are asking inside our continents. Let's not forget that if there has been always a strong call in exploring the, pot uh, the, the potentiality of the economical connection with, with China and the close work with uh, the biggest market uh, worldwide, uh, it's clear that the situation nowadays is far, far away uh, from a level playing, uh, for a level uh, playing field. Uh, on the contrary, uh, since China joined the WTO, we have seen that there was an asymmetry growing and the premises and, and, the, the, um, and uh, beat the preconditions that at that time were set, uh, thinking that we would have attracted uh, them in a full respect of a, a real and equal and fair system of competition has not been respected so far. And uh, in, the, in that moment, I think that even more than ever, it's important to stress on the need of reciprocity in these relationships and to take uh, also adequate uh, measures to ensure that their the strong defense from Chinese authority and their firm position in the respect of the conditions should be played also from our side, uh, uh, adopting all the tools and the measures necessary to uh, uh, not, not just defend us commercially and have, of course, in this regard, uh, credit towards our uh, business company, but moreover, to have the access to these impartial observation missions to assess also the conditions of the workers and the population involved. I mean, I'm thinking here, of course, uh, mainly about the situation of uh, uh, the Uyghurs community in Xinjiang, uh, again, condemning this continued refusal at the request for access to the Chinese region of Michel Bachelet, that is the High Commissioner of UN uh, Human Rights. Uh, this is, of course, a clear uh, clue and, uh, and a clear sign of the fact that this uh, lack of reciprocity and this lack of uh, commitment is still going on. Um, we should not be naive, and as, as I said, because we know that uh, BRI initiative will continue and uh, for many countries will be seen as a um, big opportunity uh, to improve the international economical system, will shape, of course, the globalization of the 21st centuries. And uh, as I told you before at the beginning of my intervention, uh, many African leaders are seeing uh, as that as a, a developing opportun opportunity for their countries, but this is not coming without a price. This is not coming without uh, a clear risk of debt dependency and a clear uh, risk of marginality of the European uh, conti continent. And we should try absolutely with our action, with our commitment to avoid uh, to lose our role and to simply become a Western appendage of the an eco economic and commercial area in which the center of gravity will continue to shift entirely to East with all regulatory and uh, uh, and the juridical and consequence of the relativization of the impact of our model that we are trying to uh, to, to propose. I so do believe that uh, this is the moment in which we have to try to implement also an answer that will take into account a uh, common asylum system to defend, of course, the, uh, the needs and the special challenges that of the most vulnerable victims of, of these uh, projections and these perspectives that are the unrepresented peoples, especially in, as we are saying in this case, um, the, the, our friends from um, Xinjiang from Uyghur ethnicity and also taking into account um, strong commitment with the Pakistani authority to ensure that uh, their compliance to the respect of the human rights and the working rights will be uh, uh, 
total growing and especially uh, also respected in in uh, regions like uh, Baluchistan, in which the the majority is uh, of population is of, from a minority that should not uh, suffer any kind of discrimination. I again uh, stress on the fact. Uh, that we need a more a stronger European coordination in addressing our position towards the uh, um, commercial, economical, and political relationship with China. Uh, I don't, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, giving, uh, creating a kind of right of veto with the future China's deals uh, uh, will be the only possible solution to adopt these. But I, do, I truly believe that we need a, a system of a common position that eventually should be created, uh, passing uh, in our foreign uh, relationship to, uh, from the um, actual system of, uh, of unanimity and veto to a system of a qualified majority that will give us, of course, the possibility uh, to do not be in the trap of vetoes as we are actually, because let's not be naive, as I said at the beginning of the intervention, there are some governments that are already under a strong and heavy influ influence uh, on because of their bilateral agreements, especially in, in Eastern Europe. And I think that uh, mm, without trespassing th this rule of unanimity, we would not be able to defend and to promote a concept of European sovereignty and the uh, coherence of all the continental bloc. We will uh, exactly leave to all the counterparts, not just China, the possibility to play with us uh, with the ancient uh, Roman rules of the Dividi et, et Impera, that means uh, split them and rule uh, over them. And uh, in that case, of course, we will undermine any possibility to be concrete and effective. I will be totally glad to continue work in that di direction uh, to strengthen the, uh, the number of tools available to, to uh, enforce at the European level uh, and uh, our relationship with the third countries, uh, the promotion of uh, concrete due diligence and business responsibility. I advocate once more the importance to ask a full compliance of our business company acting in third countries too. And uh, I hope that we will be able to enlarge more and more the community of MEPs that are strictly committed to this vision because uh, just ignoring the problem, denying that, and think that uh, applying the business usual will fit to our interests uh, will let us discover one day that uh, our are too little became also a too late. Thank you very much. Fabio, um, I'm um, so glad that you came here with us. Uh, you gave us uh, nine, 10 bullet points um, and we have a lot to work on. Um, I particularly appreciated the fact that you said that they need to be credible as Europeans uh, um, and as European institutions and uh, they need to be constructive. Um, in this regard, I would like to remind uh, all the organizations that there is a call for submission of the European Commission to do uh, to make suggestions, actually, for the new regulation regarding the GSP. And I think this be, will be like a very important tool uh, and a way in which uh, NGOs, uh, stakeholders, and companies uh, we can we never forget them um, to. Um, really improve uh, the tools uh, that we we already have so i think this is uh, absolutely great uh and thank you very much for your suggestions uh and i'm i'm sure we are incredibly late but um i really uh want to give a floor uh, to uh Zhuzha, uh which she has she has been a uh, great over the years with uh, WMPO and helping all of us uh, in supporting human rights, but she is incredibly knowledgeable regarding EU-China relations. And uh, today, uh, the Premier Li said for the first time that uh, China will not set an annual economic um, 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 target, uh, which was the core of the Chinese narrative so far. So, uh, before to conclude, Zhuzha, what is, uh, in view of all this news and what will happen this week with the, uh, the assembly, what do you think are, is the future of the EU-China relations and uh, which are the biggest uh, challenges that we will have to face? Thank you, Lucia. Well, it's quite difficult to speak at the end because so much has already been said and I don't want to repeat <laughs> 
but maybe that actually helps to just stress certain points that were important that I would have also made. And listening to all the interesting contributions, what I find is that, and what makes me happy is to see that every single speaker really uh, emphasized the importance of values and the fact that with growing presence uh, from China in Europe, this is being translated into influence. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges for Europe in the future uh, after COVID. But I think we actually need to be looking back much earlier into EU-China relations to really be able to have a good understanding of what we can expect. Because the problems have started much earlier. I would go, first of all, back to 2008, uh, the global financial crisis, because at that, that was the point where we saw a fundamental shift in EU-China relations, where the EU has become more timid and more inward-looking, struggling with a lot of internal crises, and that still continues today. And China, as a result of that, has really become more um, willing and ready to, to get a foothold in Europe member states were uh, more willing to cooperate with China, and this meant um, cutting deals that were state-backed, uh, providing a lot of um, access to Chinese companies, but at the same time not having the same access in China. So this is the reciprocity, which was already touched upon earlier. Uh, but the biggest uh, challenge looking forward is this, that China, with this growing influence, and they are not shy about saying what they want to see in the future. They want to see a China-centric world. They do use the same sort of norms that we, um, we stress in Europe, so uh, mutual benefit, win-win, um, equality, partnership, cooperation, uh, they, they pick up some of the same uh, norms, but they add more of their own. And this is their effective, um, effective, this is showing that they are being effective in shaping the narrative. So this is closely linked to, to the challenge that we face, to what extent Europe will be able to uh, maintain the post-World War uh, uh, global order that we have had up to now that is facing a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, Europe has always uh, placed and claimed to do so to more or less um, success to always promote these values in our relationship with China. Um, but, uh, and, and as I've been looking at EU-China relations for the past, say, 10 years, I've always looked at, you know, how capable are we to really have an influence on China? And, as we're having this conversation today, it is so clear that we really have to look more into how capable is China to influence us. So that's the other side of the coin that is equally important. Uh, beyond the values and, you know, the, the, there's pretty tangible examples by now that China is putting forward this concept of, for example, um, a community of shared values for mankind. Um, a really effective um, approach to having a post-COVID, because let's say if we look at what is the future for, for EU-China, it's a really effective way to get to, to uh, a China-centric world. Uh, here, however, the other um, factor that I would stress that we also need to look a little bit beyond EU-China, because I mean, clearly this talk is to talk about, you know, what, what can we expect and what are the challenges, but uh, we also need to understand that, I'm sure we can agree on this, that EU-China, beyond EU-China really, it, it is US-China relations that will define the world that we will live in, but just as important it is to look at how in this process Washington will manage its relations with, with Europe. And we see that with COVID-19, Europe's relevance globally is being reassessed uh, in this uh, US-China competition. So we need to also look at the bigger context and see that uh, Europe needs to get its act together and needs to make sure that um, those values that we claim to respect at home and we you know, try to promote internally. We need to keep them 
high on the agenda, but this is not going to be easy. And this was already um, um, alluded to that uh, we need stronger EU coordination. And I think another very important aspect to look at is the fact that, you know, we, we keep saying EU this, EU that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the EU is an international organization of sovereign member states. And every member state in foreign policy really maintains their full sovereignty. They have uh, in the past decades, you know, agreed to work together, uh, but uh, it is not only Central or Eastern European countries who have, uh, you know, started building up stronger relations. I would point out that every single country and has their bilateral dealings with China. So I think uh, this is going to be a challenge and I'm not very optimistic because it is a structural problem or it's an inherent fragmentation and COVID-19 has showed that China has always been skillful in exploiting that. So uh, yes, values, uh, shaping the narrative. Uh, however, to, to finish maybe on a more positive uh, note is that I think uh, with all the mm, difficulties, we need uh, like a triple A approach, I would say. So we need to be uh, aware of what is happening and we need to maintain uh, the debate in the EU. We need to be alert that that Chinese influence, uh, Chinese presence in Europe is really translating into influence and we need to have better communication on that and we need to be ambitious because I think together we can do more. There's been good examples that have been uh, put forward and I, I trust that uh, having a screening mechanism will help get us closer. So with that, I think still engagement needs to remain. We should not choose between the US or China because we need to have our own shape. Uh, I mean, our own capacity to shape future developments. We should not be put in that position that, that we have to choose. But again, this goes beyond the, today's debate. So I don't want to take uh, too much more of the time, but um, this is what I, wanted to add to the debate. And thanks for getting us all together to exchange our ideas, Lucia. No, thank you very much, Yuja. Um, when you said being aware, being alert and being ambitious, I think it should become a slogan <laughs> for the EU <laughs> and for all the member states, because it's true, we are all, um, there are whole member states and um, uh, this is what compose um, the European Union. Um, I am amazed by the quality of the contribution that all the speakers uh, brought uh, to uh, this conversation and I'm very glad that many people will have a chance to watch it. Um, I ha we have lots of things to discuss. Uh, the UNPO will release a press release uh, after this and um, what I would like to say is that I really hope that this is going to be the first of different, different like several actually uh, exchange of views with you uh, and again uh, Zhuzha would like to give you the floor for uh, uh, in other occasions to tell us more about these insights and uh, all the mechanisms that usually don't come up uh, immediately while talking about China and uh, your relationships. So um, I'm really really glad uh, that we had this conversation today and uh, I think it's very challenging um, not only for NGOs, but also for uh, all the stakeholders, politicians that are involved in this, uh, uh, in this context. So uh, I wish you all of us good luck, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But I, in a more positive uh, view, I think that um, things can really be changed because as you said, there are the tools to do that and uh, other tools can be created to do so. so um, I think uh, there is, yes, a lot to do, but there are even positive angles for that. So thank you very much again uh, to all of you for being with us and uh, see you soon the next time. May I just say one quick thing, Lucia? Absolutely. I just wanted to end up this meeting uh, with a special thanks to you to have organized this moment uh, and for the wonderful job you have done in the last months because when we achieved the victory, 
uh, for Ilan Toti of the Sakharov Prize. It was, I think, the biggest reward and one of the coherent action we really need to show that the European Union is, co is totally compliant and coherent with the values we are promoting to, let's say, challenge it, this uh, double standard narrative that sometimes is linked uh, to the perception the, from third countries and partners uh, worldwide. And I think that it was the biggest message that we could have sent to the minorities worldwide that they are not alone. They, we are standing together with us and we will continue to be a continent of, of freedom, of rights, and uh, we link to the promotion of those values that made our example so much unique worldwide. And this is also because of your wonderful uh, job in coordination and also because as MEPs, we were able to put besides the different labels of the groups, of the identities, but to really put uh, in the front line what is uh, uh, making us a team. And I hope that with the same spirit, we will continue having a, an ambitious strategy uh, towards the next years. So thank you once more for this occasion. And thanks to all friends from UNPO and all friends from NGOs with which we are cooperating daily for uh, your fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so much. you very much. <laughs> Thank you to all of you, and yes, see you next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye, you bye. bye. I'm stopping the recording.